The Jedi High Council, or simply the Jedi Council, is one of the most iconic elements of world building introduced in the Star Wars prequel trilogy, symbolizing both the Old Order's greatness as well as their failings. Comprised of 12 of the Order's wisest and strongest members, this august body of super space wizards has played pivotal roles in the Star Wars narrative since their introduction in 1999, with their in-universe deeds spanning roughly 25,000 years of galactic history. In today's video, we will be ranking the members of the prequel era Jedi High Council from weakest to strongest in order to determine which masters reign supreme. However, before we go over the list, I need to establish disclaimers as there are many. Firstly, as I said a second ago, this video will be based exclusively on the known council members who lived during the events of the Star Wars prequel trilogy, more specifically between the years 32 BBY and 19 BBY. My reasoning behind this distinction stem from matters of character consistency and video oversaturation. Like it or not, the film era Jedi Council is, by far, the most well-known and combatively explored variant of the group in the entire franchise, with their shared time frame making their power scaling in relation to each other much easier to quantify than others. As interesting as the Council Masters from the Dawn of the Jedi or the Knights of the Old Republic eras may be, there are simply too many of them across the Old Jedi Order's history for me to do justice to in a single video. Furthermore, despite sharing the same name and purpose as its predecessor, Luke Skywalker's New Jedi Order Council is a distinct entity unto itself, and therefore deserving of its own ranking video at a later date. Plus, the NJO Council completely fucking decimates the KOTOR and prequel councils, so it's not even a fair comparison. On a similar note, I will also not be covering characters such as Jocasta Nu and Sifo-Dyas, as while they were both noted to have served as members of the Council and were alive past Phantom Menace, neither was an active member of the group during the prequel storyline, thereby disqualifying them. Secondly, in regards to presentation style, I will be following the same tier classification system I used in my Skywalker ranking video rather than a linear numerical system, since the power scaling of the prequel council is much less direct than what can be observed from either the Battlemasters or the Grandmasters. Thirdly, in regards to content analysis, this video will be based almost exclusively on the prequel era Jedi Council as it is depicted in the Legends continuity, meaning that characters such as Master Katri from the Tales of the Jedi miniseries will not be factored in. However, there will be a few select instances where I reference Disney canon material to clarify certain aspects of a specific character's ranking. Lastly, I want to make it clear that while a few of these Jedi can be said to have not reached their peaks until after the events of the prequels or never did so period, I will be examining them based on how they are presented in the prequel timeline rather than what they eventually became or could have been. That said, I will reference where their hypothetical and OT trilogy peaks could go when and where I deem appropriate. With all that out of the way, let's get started. Starting in F tier, we have the Feetless Unnamed Gran, the Feetless Unnamed Purple Guy, and the Feetless Jedi Master Coltman Cash. These three represent the quote-unquote fodder of the Jedi Council. We know nothing about who Gran and Purple were, much less what they were capable of combatively, as they only appear during a council meeting session in the first issue of the General Grievous miniseries. Coleman Cash has the advantage of having a name and even a few blink and you'll miss them appearances in TV and film, but again, he has never been shown doing anything, nor is he attributed with anything notable in any supplementary legend sources. That being said, if we widen our scope to include Disney canon material, Cash's entry in the new Clone Wars character encyclopedia states that he had been a formidable warrior during his younger years, but had since come to see battles as tragic failures to find mutual understanding. This statement alone is enough to warrant placing Coleman Cash at the top of this tier, since it at least confirms that he actually knows how to fight, which is more than you can say for either Gran or Purple.
Next in E tier, we have the Jedi Masters Coleman Trebor and Stassa Lee. Despite possessing major differences in their skill sets, Coleman and Stas share several equivalencies in characterization and combative portrayal, which is why I place them on the same overall tier. Longtime fans know I enjoy poking fun at Coleman Trebor for being quickly gunned down by Jango Fett, despite possessing both a 360 degree field of vision and a mastery of Sarisu, the lightsaber style designed to defend against blaster bolts, but he's not entirely worthless. In truth, his shortcomings are more ones of focus rather than ability. Coleman's entry in the official Star Wars fact file states that he is more of a negotiator than a combatant, which makes sense given that he was elevated to the Council specifically to be their PR guy, his political insight being revered by his peers. That being said, his fact file also states that despite his strength not equating to his diplomacy, Trevor was still capable of defeating most general adversaries, likely assassins hired to kill politicians given his station, and it even credits him with a degree of mastery of force stealth sufficient to hide his presence from a passive Attack of the Clones Count Dooku, a feat worth taking into account for its control if nothing else. However, we still can't neglect that we are talking about a council master who was almost instantly gunned down by Jango Fett despite possessing 360 degree vision and training in Form 3. Jango is by no means a slouch, but it's still a very bad look for Coleman Trebor when Episode 2 Obi-Wan Kenobi batted away the same volley of blaster shots that killed him. And I simply don't see that happening to any of the other counselors ranked above him on this list. Stas Ali was the younger cousin of the famed Jedi Master Adi Galea, and while she is noted to have had less of a combative mentality than her kinswoman, her more fleshed out skill set compared to Coleman's does at least warrant placing her at the top of this tier. Although Stas also functioned primarily as a diplomat, she was also an incredibly proficient Jedi healer, her talents earning her a seat on the Order's Circle of Healers. Considering that Force Healing is a branch of power known for its complexity, Ali's standing amongst her era's best is not to be overlooked. Despite what some video games would have you believe, your average Jedi cannot pull off full healing in the midst of battle at the drop of a hood. It takes skill to mend through the Force, which adds credence to statements about Stas's ethereal talents being one of the primary considerations for her council elevation. In regards to feats, Ali, unlike Trevor, survived the battle at the Petronaki Arena, and although she spent the majority of the Clone Wars in the Healing Corps, it did not prevent her from igniting her saber when necessary. During the Battle of Coruscant, Stas Ali fought General Grievous in an off-screen battle and got absolutely thrashed. That said, not only did she survive the engagement, but she is heavily implied to have also defeated two of Grievous's personal Magna Guards. Considering that several sources have confirmed Magna Guards to be formidable opponents for most Jedi, with Grievous himself rivaling many of the strongest characters in the franchise, this feat is notable even if it skews negatively. While this is pure speculation, given his tendencies, it is probable that Grievous initially unleashed his guards on Stas to test her strength, then proceeded to engage the Jedi Master himself once she defeated them. If that was the case, you can argue that Stas Ali's survival was owed to either Grievous raiding her highly enough to spare her, or even her advanced healing powers either of which would still place her well beyond your rank-and-file Jedi Knight. In D tier, we have the Jedi Masters Adi Galea, Evan Peel, and Yariel Poof. Now, these three are what I would refer to as models of your average council member, with their strength being the most consistent level one could witness from the rank across multiple eras. As mentioned, Adi Galea was stated to have had a more combat-oriented focus than her cousin Stas Ali, which, when combined with her better overall standing in the lore, logically places her above E-tier. 
Galia's reputation as both a diplomat and a combatant were well known in her era, with Mace Windu once implying that there was no disparity between her capabilities in either field, further supporting the notion that she was a more well-rounded council master than the ones featured previously. Even the infamous Jedi hunter Aura Singh seemed to hold a measure of respect for Adi during the hunt for Aura Singh arc in the Republic comic series. I would also be remiss if I didn't point out that the Tholathian Master was the only member of her squad besides Ashrad Het to land a hit on Singh during that entire arc. Regarding feats, Adi Galea has died in two separate continuities during the time of the Clone Wars, with both fights, ironically, speaking to similar levels of ability depending on one's interpretation. The first occurred in Issue 5 of the Obsession arc of the Clone Wars comics, wherein General Grievous killed her after a short duel during the Battle of Boz Pity. Like her cousin, Adi would take down two of Grievous's Magna Guards before engaging the General himself. While she did not survive the fight, we do get a more definitive depiction of events, plus since they were in the middle of a raging war zone, Grievous finishing her off was probably more good tactics than lousy evaluation. Addy's second death was depicted in Season 5, Episode 1 of TCW, wherein the Sith apprentice Savage Opress slays her during a skirmish on Florum. Though initially able to block, dodge, and even counter the brutish Knight Brothers' assault, Galia ultimately folded under Opress's might, being gored by his horns and finished off with a saber stab through the torso. Considering that Savage Opress is noted to possess a force connection that exceeded that of his brother Darth Maul, who even during Phantom Menace was one of the strongest Sith Lords ever, Adi Galea's ability to contest with him is still impressive even if she did lose. Evan Peel was a longtime friend of Adi Galea and was consistently portrayed keeping pace with her during their mission to Malastare. Regarding his combative scaling, Peel has various statements of being a mighty warrior, particularly in lightsaber combat. He is one of the few characters on this list confirmed to have mastered all seven forms of classical Jedi fighting, with his reputation as a swordsman striking both respect and fear galaxy-wide. Many downplay Peel's strength due to his two deaths, yes, that happened to him as well, coming at the hands of a squad of clone troopers and a crazed Anuba beast. However, there are many variables at play in both of these engagements that tend to be overlooked. The novel Coruscant Nights 1 Jedi Twilight states that Evan had been physically and spiritually exhausted well before the clones attacked him, and he was clearly caught off guard by the Anuba's attack, which makes things more understandable. The Lannick Master was also proficient in using the Force in battle, despite his preferences for saber combat. While the Galactic Atlas' statements of Peel being revered for his telekinetic powers is a post-Legends source, I do very much buy into it, considering he has displayed a range and magnitude with TK beyond Adi Galea, even if only just. His most notable feat occurred in the aforementioned Twilight novel, wherein through an advanced healing technique or his sheer force energy reserves, Evan Peel temporarily preserved his life after suffering massive internal injuries from a grenade explosion. These injuries included broken bones, limbs, ruptured organs, and a snapped spine. Yeah. Yariel Poof is at the top of this tier, which I imagine is surprising for some considering he's often seen as a joke of a character, helped in no small measure by his portrayal in the Robot Chicken Star Wars specials. However, when it's looked at critically, Poof is a rather OP Jedi Master, albeit highly specialized, which is why he's not ranked any higher. While he is stated to be skilled with his lightsaber, which was demonstrated when he took down the infamous General Korda and three of his men within Coruscant's core, it is mainly the Quarrymen's Force abilities that set him apart. In addition to several statements that directly refer to Poof as an extremely powerful Jedi Master, he is noted by numerous sources to be one of, if not THE most gifted telepaths of the High Council. 
The dude even had the space balls to flex his mental abilities on Mace Windu and the Zam Wessel one-shot, arguing that they would prove a better asset than Mace's when it came to guarding Coruscant from the Infant of Shaw, to which Mace agrees without hesitation. In keeping with his specializations, Yariel perfected the advanced powers of Jedi Mind Tricks, Battle Meditation, Pyrokinesis, and even Force Illusions, which enabled him to conjure apparitions of whatever he desired to instill fear in the hearts of his foes. His mirages are stated to be so effective that he could convince other Jedi that he was invisible. For reference, a trained force adept influencing the mind of another is consistently portrayed as an extremely high-tier feat since they are all born with a degree of passive telepathic resistance. This accolade would mean that even if Poof wasn't strong enough to dominate the psyches of Addy and Evan, he would be able to mess with them enough to keep them at arm's length and exploit openings since I do believe that both masters could beat the Quarrymen in a saber fight. Feet-wise, Yariel Poof, like Evan Peel, has never been depicted in a fight with an opposing force wielder, with his only significant engagement being the skirmish with General Korba and his men on Coruscant. Poof easily bested his foes, but was mortally wounded by Korba after the Jedi Master attempted to retrieve the Shaw idol that was getting ready to detonate. Again, much like Evan, a lot of people tend to downplay Poof's performance despite, again again, like Evan, it's fairly evident that Poof was caught off guard by the General's recovery as his focus was centered on the idol that was about to destroy the planet. This leads to Jarl's most famous feat, where he uses the last of his powers to contain the energies of the Infant of Shaw before its detonation, saving Coruscant at the cost of his life. The Shaw Idol is repeatedly stated in story and in guides to be an artifact with the power to destroy entire planets. While the word planets is rather vague, even if we just use Coruscant's official size as reference, this still means that a dying Yariel Poof had the strength to bind the energies of something capable of obliterating our Earth. So, yeah, you can mock his design and laugh at the parodies all you want, but it doesn't change the fact that this guy could solo many of your favorite fictional universes. Occupying C-tier, we have the Jedi Masters Yaddle, Eithkoth, and Oppo Rancisis. If D-tier represented the average council members, then I would say that C-tier represents the exceptional council members. They are not exactly the franchise's pinnacle, but they are stronger than most of their era. Yaddle, also known as the One Below, was considered an almost fable-like character by her generation. Following the death of her master Polvin Kut on the planet Koba, the then Padawan member of Yoda's species was imprisoned underground where she remained for over 200 years. Rather than succumbing, Yaddle spent her long confinement training, refining everything Polvin had previously taught her while fighting off the vicious predators who dwelled beneath Koba's surface. She became so powerful that she eventually achieved a state of unity with the Force itself, a feat few across galactic history have ever attained. Upon her escape back to the Order, it was decided almost unanimously that Yaddle required no additional training and she was directly elevated to Council status, an unprecedented promotion for an unprecedented story. That being said, Yaddle's development did not stop there, as she spent the following centuries training apprentices such as Oppo Rancisis and immersing herself in ancient Force lore, growing much stronger as a result. While her databank entry states that she has never been as martial a figure as her council peers, it also confirms that her years of exposure to obscure knowledge granted her powers that, quote, few can fathom, which does compensate. By the time of the prequel era, Yaddle was an extremely powerful Jedi Master with a staggering breadth of knowledge, having mastered the ancient Force Light and the forbidden Moritro, both techniques being good counters to Yariel Poof's abilities. 
In regards to more direct scaling, Master Yaddle was depicted to be stronger than Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi and Padawan Anakin Skywalker during their mission to Ma four years before the Clone Wars. Obi-Wan deferred to Yaddle when it came time to hold back a small tidal wave telekinetically, and he even received an amp just by fighting alongside her, almost as though she was a walking, talking nexus of light side energy, which, given the whole unity with the Force thing, might not be a total impossibility. When Yaddle later sacrificed herself by absorbing the explosion of a chemical weapon capable of killing thousands into her own body, Anakin was so astonished by the depths of the Jedi Master's power that he couldn't even move, stating point-blank that he had never felt the Force move as it did. While these versions of Obi-Wan and Anakin were obviously weaker than their Episode 2 incarnations, Master Yaddle being stronger than both of them is still very impressive since Anakin alone is cited as the most gifted Padawan in the history of the Order years prior. In regards to Yaddle's battle with Jedi Dooku in the Disney canon Tales of the Jedi miniseries, while I do view it as evidence for her swordsmanship not being so far below the D-tier masters that it would lower her overall ranking, I also don't view it as justification for placing her higher since she performed so poorly. This makes sense considering that Dooku, even as a Jedi, is confirmed to have been one of the strongest adepts in galactic history. Eeth Koth's strength, as I mentioned in my How Powerful is Sherad Het video, is also a bit anomalous between continuities, though there are several through lines. Eeth is noted by many sources to be a seasoned member of the Council, and is considered an especially strong member due to his martial skills and endurance. Fun fact, he was initially pitched as the leader of the High Council in Phantom Menace before it was decided to shift the role over to Yoda and Mace Windu. The Zabrak's most notable achievement as a Jedi, this is actually stated, was his successful mentorship of the legendary knight Sherad Het, also known as the Howl Runner, also known as the Champion of Kermar, also known as the Tamer of Tyrants, among other epithets. Again, I go into much more depth in the HPW video, but there is a strong narrative implication that Koth and Het are comparable in strength even if they aren't equals, which further supports the notion of Koth being an above average council master since Het is directly stated to be council level. His most noteworthy ability as a force user was his mastery of the Crucitorn power. Also referred to by the fan term Pain Transcendence, Crucitorn enabled practitioners to reduce and absorb the effects of physical pain well beyond their natural thresholds. Through vigorous mental discipline, users could stabilize their performance levels by cutting themselves off from painful sensations, or even enhance their strength by feeding off them almost like an automatic adrenaline rush. The power's level of effectiveness was tied to the practitioner's skills and raw physical strength, with Eeth's tough Zabraki hide being stated to have made him an ideal vessel. In terms of feats, Master Koth slew multiple Yinchori warriors during the Yinchori Uprising, and later fended off General Grievous for a short time with an injured arm before being jumped by Magna Guards during the early Clone Wars. Granted, this was TCW's iteration of Grievous, which is far less impressive than his past incarnation. However, given that Koth was outnumbered and injured at the time, this feat still speaks better of him than Stas or Adi's fights, especially since the fact file directly states that Grievous would not have taken him easily without aid from his guards. Opo Rancisis was the former apprentice of Yaddle, and is pretty much this tier's equivalent of Yariel Poof. His swordsmanship is nothing to downplay, but his wisdom and force abilities are what truly put him on that next level. Rancisis has various accolades of being one of the most respected and cunning members of the entire prequel era council. While not the leader of the entire order, he is credited as the head of the Council of Reconciliation, a position that was reserved for only the most esteemed and powerful of Jedi Consulars. A military mastermind hailed for his firm grasp of warfare and tactics, Oppo's brilliance led to several key Republic victories during the Clone Wars, making him arguably the most battle-intelligent Jedi on this list, at least in terms of large-scale military efforts. 
That being said, the Thispian also practiced several esoteric techniques that granted him distinct advantages in personal combat, the most notable of which being battle meditation and malacia. A fan favorite, battle meditation was a pinnacle telepathic ability that enabled practitioners to amp the morale, stamina, and overall combat prowess of allies while simultaneously reducing the combat effectiveness of foes by reducing their will to fight. Malaysia functioned on a much more personal basis, allowing users to induce a powerful sense of dizziness and nausea upon an organic target by turning their equilibriums against them. Oppo's perfection of the power being stated to make him one of the mightiest of all Jedi, which, even if we take to mean just during his era, still speaks well towards his scaling. A glimmer of Oppo Rancisis's combative prowess was showcased during the Siege of Seleucami, wherein he was set upon by six Anzadi warriors armed with cortosis weapons and defeated all of them despite being exhausted from months of prolonged use of his battle meditation. Despite the initial victory, the Anzadi's attack provided the Dark Jedi Sora Bulk just the distraction he needed to sneak up behind the Thispian and stab him through the back ending his life. As noted by multiple sources, Anzadi were among the most dangerous groups of assassins in the galaxy, with this particular squad comprising the most skilled masters at the time. Master Rancisis fought half a dozen of these beings and not only survived, but won. This display is made all the more impressive when we remember that Oppo was heavily weakened by literal months of extended battle meditation, meaning that we've never actually seen the Thispian fight at the peak of his capabilities. This nerf directly contributed to the success of Sora's assassination. While a brilliant tactical move on Sora's part, especially given Oppo's telepathic prowess, the fact that he and Dooku felt it necessary to send in the Anzadi for a preemptive strike and pay direct lip service to the Jedi Master's weakened state does confirm that they took his strength seriously. For reference, Sora is credited as one of the greatest lightsaber instructors in the history of the old Jedi Order, and Dooku is credited as one of the most powerful adepts in the entire franchise. I'm not saying that I think a peak Obo Rancisis would defeat Count Dooku or Sora Bulk in a one-on-one -on -one fight, I don't, but he clearly wouldn't go down easily either. In B tier, we have the Jedi Masters Saisi Tin, Egan Kolar, and Kit Fisto. Many of you will likely recognize these High Council members as the ones who comprised Mace Windu's hand-selected task force assigned to destroy the Crimson Nova Bounty Hunters Guild, and later to kill Chancellor Palpatine after he had been revealed as the Sith Lord Darth Sidious. All three of these guys share multiple statements of being amongst the strongest masters in not just their era, but all eras of galactic history. This would scale them above the council members featured in the previous tiers, as none of them, except maybe Oppo, possess any supreme grade accolades. Regarding their standing compared to each other, the trio's death order, as presented in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, ironically represents how I would personally rank them. Saisi Tin is at the bottom of this tier since he has the least impressive feats and tends to serve in more of a support role than the other masters, mainly in the capacity of a pilot. In fact, Tin is stated to have been the greatest Jedi pilot of his day until Anakin came along, which isn't exactly a low bar. Fun fact number two, Saisi was the one put in charge of examining Darth Maul's captured Sith infiltrator after his defeat on Naboo, and actually described the ship's aura as somewhat tempting him to the dark side. The Itachi's instincts for flying were best expressed by his mastery of the technique known as instinctive astrogation. This force ability enabled users to instantly perceive and chart the safest routes through both real space and hyperspace, with Tin's level of skill having advanced to the point where he no longer required a nav computer to travel. Saisi, like his peers in this tier, is noted to possess an incredible degree of power and was also, by his own admission, rather hard-headed, smashing his way through all opposition foolish enough to get in his way. 
He literally caught and redirected a fucking homing missile mid-flight, a feat that impressed Mace Windu, and then went full force unleashed by picking up the body of a Hellfire tank and using it to crush a giant super battle droid during the Battle of Iktach. Apart from his final battle with Sidious, which he lost almost immediately due to a number of factors I will address later, Saisi has never been depicted in a prolonged fight against another force wielder. That being said, the Iktachi could keep pace with Mace during a sparring session years before the Clone Wars, and had no reservations about the prospect of potentially facing the then-renegade Quinlan Voss, both of which speak towards an incredible level of strength. Agen Kolar has less exploration as a Force user than Saisi, however his showcased ethereal talents are still close enough for me to consider them on par, and when it comes to their demonstrated martial skills, there is literally no contest between them. Agen is stated by a number of sources to be stronger than many of his council brethren, with Obi-Wan at one point referring to him as a great blades being along the same lines as Mace Windu, who also held the Zabrak in high esteem. Six months into the Clone Wars, Kolar was dispatched to Nar Shaddaa to apprehend Quinlan Voss, and after a brief chase, confronted the renegade in an alleyway. The two fought, however, Fought is a bit of a misnomer in this case, since it mainly consisted of Aegon stomping Quinlan left, right, and center while deliberately holding back. Voss doesn't even land a single hit. The Kiffer only manages to get away from the Zabrak after he sliced open a nearby cage of amphibians, which gave him the opening he needed to run away while his foe dealt with the creatures. Quinlan is stated to have been no match for Aegon in the fact file, with both Yoda and Thalm noting that he would have been killed had Aegon been fighting seriously. While this was not a prime version of Quinlan Voss, he was still stronger than when he fought a weakened Volfe Carco, and the fact that Aegon dominated him so completely leads me to believe that even if the battle had taken place towards the end of the war, nothing would have changed which is very impressive considering that Prime Voss is generally considered to be an E or D tier council fighter. Kit Fisto is at the top of this tier due to the fact that he lasted the longest against Darth Sidious, the then most powerful Sith in history, as well as just having more impressive feats and a deeper level of exposure in the lore. A noted innovator with an appropriately free-flowing view of the universe, Fisto's abilities were truly extraordinary. In keeping with his aquatic heritage, the Jedi Master created a number of techniques specifically for underwater combat, such as the Force Water Orb and what I like to call the Force Water Beam, the former of which being powerful enough to punch massive holes through a massive corn crab cannon. While specialized in their application, even if Kit's feats on land were only half the level of his strength underwater, they still speak towards a degree of ability far beyond the standards of his era. During the Clone Wars, Master Fisto would outright defeat TCW General Grievous, which ranks him solidly above Eeth Koth, and hold his own against the ancient bounty hunter Dirge alongside Plo Koon during a riot within an Outer Rim prison planet on Nimbardi. The Jedi Master's most notable feat outside of his engagement with Darth Sidious was his battle with Asajj Ventress within the catacombs of Ord Cestus. While ultimately defeated, Kit still gave the Dark Jedi a high diff fight, which is rather impressive considering that this was the same Ventress who was nearly equal to early Clone Wars Anakin Skywalker and had taken the time to observe the Nautilus fighting style beforehand, giving her an edge. Next in A tier, we have the Jedi Masters Kiadi Mundi, Deepa Balaba, Revenge of the Sith, Shakti, and Plo Koon. These are the highest echelon of the Jedi Council who fall just short of being supreme grade characters. Kiadi Mundi is credited by a number of sources as one of the strongest Jedi of the entire prequel era, with his former master Yoda stating that his skills were sufficient to defeat even the legendary Sherad Het who, as mentioned, is heavily implied to be just as strong, if not stronger, than Eeth Koth. 
Key's original data bank entry corroborates these accolades by stating that he was considered to be in the upper tier of the High Council alongside Mace Windu and Yoda by the time of Episode 3. While the term upper tier in this context could refer to elements such as wisdom or influence, if the statement is even remotely a reference to strength, something Mace and Yoda obviously don't lack, then this is solid evidence for Ki also being above the Masters in B tier. In regards to force combat, Mundi's moveset was fairly standard for a Council Master, however his power level was most assuredly not. He is not just stated to be powerful, but extremely so. We're talking about a guy who can produce craters in the ground while exhausted, and lift entire skiffs like they were nothing after having just suffered a broken arm. During the first year of the Clone Wars, Kiadi Mundi went blow for blow with Asajj Ventress on Coruscant, and can even be argued to have forced her into a backpedal before she finally fled the scene. Even if Asajj's retreat was strictly motivated by tactical viability, the two combatants still fought evenly the entire time, which is more than you can say for Kit Fisto, and Kiadi did assert that should they ever face each other again, Asajj would die by his hands. Even if that declaration was all talk, it speaks at least to the Jedi Master's confidence in his ability to take her down under the right circumstances. Master Mundi was also the last Jedi standing against the Legends General Grievous during the Battle of Hypori, the cyborg clearly focusing the bulk of his attention on him. While he only survived the battle due to the intervention of a squad of Ark clones, Kiadi does state that he and his companions were exhausted well before Grievous had attacked them, making the Sarian's ability to pull through, let alone fight back, truly extraordinary. Deepa Balaba was the former apprentice of Mace Windu and basically his surrogate daughter. While I do consider her force abilities to be the least impressive of this tier, given that the bulk of her powers manifested in the sense branch, I also view her martial abilities, at least in a technical sense, to be at the top of this tier, which is why her overall ranking falls into the middle. Deepa has many, and I mean many, accolades of being one of the deadliest lightsaber duelists of her era, with Mace stating that she had showcased blade work that surpassed even his own during their mission to Nar Shadda. While this statement was in reference to Deepa's showcased capabilities in that specific scenario rather than her overall capability, the fact that she could outperform Mace in any capacity is nothing short of legendary. At the crux of the Summertime War, Deepa Balaba would fight and nearly kill Mace Windu within the bowels of a ministry building after she succumbed to the dark side of the Force, only being quote-unquote saved by the intervention of the Corrin Nick Rostu. This bout is rather popular, and while I agree that it speaks incredibly well towards Master Balaba's capabilities, certain fans also tend to oversell her performance a bit. I've heard some try to argue that this battle proves that Deepa is stronger than Mace, when that just isn't the case. The novel makes it very clear that Mace was physically, mentally, and spiritually nerfed throughout the battle. He was physically nerfed by Deepa stabbing him through the gut with her saber in a surprise attack. He was spiritually nerfed by Harun Kal's dark side nexus eating away at his aura. And he was mentally nerfed by not wanting to fight his surrogate daughter. Not only that, but the book also depicts a sequence wherein Deepa is amped by the accumulative force energies of Kar Vaster's act guards that were channeled into her each time one of them died, meaning that she had not been fighting her former master at her typical power level. That being said, even if there are several circumstances at play with the Mace fight, as I said, the fact that Deepa Balaba could outperform him in any capacity is still indicative of a level of strength that precious few could contend with. Speaking of Jedi Masters that few could mess with, Shock T, even when strictly examined during the time frame of Revenge of the Sith, was an absolute beast. She is stated time and time again to be one of the strongest members of the High Council being revered as one of the highest of the Old Order, with even Obi-Wan Kenobi considering her to be the most cunning Jedi he had ever known. 
Her raw power is noted to stand out amongst the council by the Force Unleashed art book, with the Clone Wars Adventures video game going a step further by referring to her strength in the Force as legendary. While the breadth of her showcased techniques, at least during the prequel era, was more on the standard side for her caliber, like with Kiari Mundi, Shock's raw power more than made up for it. She could create massive craters, and even briefly hold back the force of Kamino's ocean while lifting up tons of rubble and debris to seal an entrance, albeit with some assistance from early Clone Wars Anakin and Obi-Wan. Moving into combative displays, Shock was the second to last Jedi standing against Legends General Grievous at the Battle of Hypori, which, while an inferior showing to Kiati, is unquantifiable in scaling due to their shared exhaustion. Healthy Shock met Grievous again during the Battle of Coruscant, and although the two never directly engaged in a prolonged fight, she would outperform both her past self and the past Kiati by actually landing hits on the general with her force powers. These feats are especially notable if you ascribe to the notion that Grievous got stronger during the Clone Wars through training, battle experience, and upgrades to his cybernetics. Shock would also take on an entire horde of Grievous's Magna Guards to secure time for her allies. Despite the staggering opposition, she would actually do pretty damn well against the guards, even speed blitzing six of them. Remember how much I hyped up Stasa Lee and Adi Galea for successfully taking down two Magna Guards? Well, here's Shock T taking on an entire horde and mowing down six in seconds. Jumping ahead to Order 66, Master T engaged Darth Vader during his attack on the Jedi Temple and was ultimately forced to flee. Now, the exact specifics of this fight are not well defined as it has never been explicitly depicted. However, issue 51 of the official Starships and Vehicles collection allegedly states that, quote, Shock T was at the Jedi Temple when Vader attacked and narrowly escaped death at the hands of the immensely more powerful Sith Lord. I say allegedly because I can't find reliable scans. With her TFU databank entry noting that she fought bravely to repel Vader's attack, but retreated when it quickly became evident that she couldn't win. Regardless of how you choose to parse these sources, the general consensus is that Shock fought Vader during Operation Nightfall, but he was too strong for her to win, which forced her to retreat. Considering that Anakin Skywalker, even before embracing the dark side, was powerful enough to defeat Count Dooku, a Sith Lord who rivaled Mace Windu and Yoda, Shock T's ability to fight and escape him is an insane accomplishment that goes to show why the Dark Lord regarded her as a worthy final test for his secret apprentice so many years later. Plo Koon is at the top of this tier as he basically combines every element of the counselors featured previously into one package. In terms of accolades, Plo is stated by the Clone Wars Adventures video game to possess lightsaber skill that would prove a challenge for any Jedi, with issue 87 of the Insider magazine further confirming him to be one of the most dangerous council masters alive by the time frame of Revenge of the Sith. His strength was such that even Darth Maul, one of the strongest Sith Lords ever, considered the Keldor to be a truly great Jedi warrior along the same lines as Mace Windu, and a true test of his skills should they ever meet in battle. As far as his force aptitude went, Plo Koon is confirmed by his encyclopedia entries to be one of the most powerful Jedi ever, possessing a myriad of unique techniques that, like with Master Yaddle, granted him distinct advantages in combat. Said techniques included the ability to alter his immediate environment to produce fog or ice, as well as the aforementioned Malaysia. Master Plo is also the only character on this list capable of conjuring Force Lightning, having perfected a rare yellow variant of the ability known as Electric Judgment, which is stated by the Jedi Path to be sprung from a sense of justice rather than hatred like its Sith equivalent. Moving into feats, Plo should scale solidly above Kit Fisto and Kiati Mundi, seeing as he performed far better against Asajj Ventress during their duel on the planet Korm, despite being heavily nerfed by a broken arm. 
While by no means an easy fight for the Keldor, he was able to land very powerful hits on the Dark Jedi with his TK, disarm her of one of her lightsabers, and ultimately succeed in his objective to separate her from her remote detonator. All of which implying that he would have won handedly had he been entirely healthy. While Darth Maul never got the chance to test his mettle against Plo, the Jedi Master would face off against Savage Opress within the Pleem's Nexus. The two went blow for blow, however Plo was brought down by the Sith Lord ripping off his oxygen mask in a surprise attack after the Jedi Master had become distracted by Savage attacking his clone troopers. Even if these variables make the fight inconclusive, it's still a very impressive showing on Plo's part given what I said earlier about Opress possessing a raw force connection that exceeded Maul's. Finally, while never depicted directly in any source, Anakin Skywalker mentions in the Clone Wars lightsaber duels video game that word spread throughout the old Jedi Order of Plo defeating Yoda in lightsaber combat. I heard you're one of the only Jedi to have ever beaten Master Yoda in a duel. Ahsoka speaks very highly of you. The bout was almost certainly a sparring session rather than an all-out fight, however, much like Deepa outperforming Mace on Nar Shadda, Plo Koon outperforming the Grand Master in any capacity really speaks to why he is considered such a legend in the community, even if there is more going for the Council Masters ranked above him. In S tier, we have the Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker, the Master of the Order Mace Windu, and the Jedi Grand Master Yoda all during the events of ROTS. All four characters share numerous accolades of being some of the strongest Jedi, period, i.e. compared to anyone who lived in any previous era or belonged to any sub-faction within the old Jedi Order's hierarchy. They are all confirmed to be amongst the strongest Jedi in the entire Star Wars franchise, period. Obi-Wan Kenobi was the first Jedi Master introduced to audiences when the license began in 1977, and as such was given ample opportunity to demonstrate his strength when it came time to explore his origins in the prequel era. Numerous sources confirm Obi-Wan's skills to have been held in great esteem by his council peers with Mace Windu stating that he was not just a master, but THE master of the Sarisu style by the time of Episode 3. This accolade is especially significant since the specific phrasing of THE master in this context would logically include every other Jedi who practices Sarisu, which coincidentally includes everyone listed on this tier. Add all of this to the fact that Count Dooku, a Sith shown to rival Anakin, Mace, and Yoda, both admitted to and was stonewalled by Obi-Wan's Form 3 defenses, and I think it's reasonable to assume that the negotiator's saber skill, at least in terms of pure Sarisu, rank at the top of the tier. Moving into his ethereal abilities, while Obi-Wan was initially perceived as not possessing a very strong force connection, years of study, meditation, and experience would allow him to grow incredibly powerful. His aura was described as luminous, and he has mastered advanced techniques such as top-tier drain knowledge resistance and blaster bolt level 2 to menace. His telekinesis was sufficient to uproot starship-sized trees and even match the might of Darth Vader during their fight on Mustafar, with some sources directly referring to them as TK equals. Granted, there's some context there, which we'll get to in a bit, but it's still an insane accolade regardless. Moving into feats, Obi-Wan would scale well above Kiadi Mundi and Plo Koon, given the fact that a weaker version of himself did better against arguably stronger variants of Asajj Ventress and Savage Opress during the Clone Wars. Jumping to the events of ROTS, Kenobi engaged Count Dooku aboard the Invisible Hand flagship and managed to not only keep up with the Sith Lord, but outright stonewall his assaults. Dooku only knocking him out with a wheel kick thanks to the interference of his droid bodyguards. During the Battle of Utapau, Obi-Wan fought Legends General Grievous and would not only outperform every single counselor who had previously opposed the cyborg, but would finally be the one to destroy him. 
The Jedi Master would later duel his former pupil Darth Vader on Mustafar. And although victorious, both men were mentally nerfed at the time, which makes the feat unquantifiable. Unencumbered Anakin is frequently referred to as a greater overall warrior than Obi-Wan, and Yoda states that the Negotiator is not strong enough to defeat Darth Sidious, whom we know scales to Yoda and Mace, which is why he's ranked at the bottom of S-tier. Anakin Skywalker is a character whose lore and feats speak for themselves. A virgin birth supposedly conceived by the Force, he was the prodigal chosen one destined to undo the damage wrought to the Force during his era. Anakin's raw potential is stated an innumerable amount of times to be greater than any adept who had lived before him in the old Jedi Order's history. Grandmaster Yoda considered the young knight to be more powerful than any Jedi he had ever known, with the then strongest Sith, Darth Sidious, stating that he could even grow to surpass him as well. During the Mortis arc of TCW, we get a brief glimpse into the depths of Anakin's latent strength when he successfully subdues both the son and the daughter, who are the literal physical avatars of the dark and light sides of the Force, a more impressive feat than anything anyone on this list has ever done. That being said, this is all about what the Chosen One could have been as opposed to what he actually was, though prequel Anakin is still a powerhouse. Jedi Skywalker is famously referred to as an unstoppable warrior by the time of ROTS, with Count Dooku stating that he had not only mastered the Dejem So style, but was the finest one he had ever seen. This accolade holds a great deal of weight since, much like Mace's praise of Obi-Wan, Dooku's specific phrasing of ever seen in this context would logically include every Jedi he knew who practiced a gem so, which, again, includes everyone listed in this tier. So, yeah, in terms of pure de gem so skill, the Chosen One remains uncontested in the prequel timeline. Regarding his combative force abilities, Anakin, even in base, is consistently referred to as either one of or THE most powerful Jedi of his era, which, depending on interpretation, could be used to argue his position higher. He practiced several advanced techniques, such as Battle Mind and Force Scream, as well as the incredibly rare Force Drain Resistance. Under certain circumstances, the Chosen One could even attain a state of pure oneness with the Force itself, a feat that has only been achieved a small handful of times across Jedi history. His telekinesis was powerful enough to toss around CIS dreadnoughts and, as mentioned, stalemate Obi-Wan Kenobi despite both of them being nerfed. Shifting into feats, Anakin Skywalker would defeat Count Dooku aboard the Invisible Hand after an intense but decisive battle. While the Sith Lord's feats are clear enough indicators, Darth Tyrannus is confirmed to be more powerful than Darth Maul and, as I've said repeatedly, a close rival to the likes of Mace Windu and Yoda, making the Chosen One's ability to beat him all the more incredible. Following his corruption to the dark side of the Force and subsequent transformation into Darth Vader, Anakin would become substantially more powerful, defeating the Jedi Masters stationed at the Temple during Order 66, including Shock T, with mid-levels of difficulty. Although the newly minted Sith Lord did lose his battle with Obi-Wan on Mustafar, as I've said, both men were mentally nerfed at the time, with Vader's overconfidence playing a major role in the loss of his limbs, which makes the power scaling tricky at best. Anakin and Obi-Wan are repeatedly stated to be equals in terms of their raw martial skill, with one of the reasons given for the absurd length of their fight being their intimate knowledge of each other's styles. That said, Anakin does have a number of accolades that refer to him as an all-around superior fighter to Obi-Wan due to his mindset and greater power, which is why I rank the Chosen One and Iota above him. Mace Windu. I could just end the analysis right there. There are oceans worth of content that confirm Mace as one of the strongest masters to have ever walked the halls of the Jedi Temple, being second only to Yoda in terms of martial prowess and force capability. 
Certain sources have even taken it a step further by claiming that the Corrin's fighting skills were completely unmatched in his era, which is insane even if they are likely referring to his knowledge base. No better example of this knowledge base exists than in Master Windu's creation and completion of the Vopad style. An evolution of the Juyo style that, once perfected, allowed users to channel their inner darkness into a weapon of the light, as well as feed off the dark energies of their foes to amp themselves. Speaking of ethereal energies, Mace's force abilities were phenomenal, his displays of power not being far below Yoda's in the grand scheme. The Master of the Order is most well known for his innate aptitude with the rare Shatter Point technique, which granted him an acute insight into metaphysical fault lines perceived through the Force, allowing him to see points of vulnerability, importance, or curiosity. This principle applied both in direct combat with another being as well as the ability to literally shatter seemingly unbreakable objects with a tap. Meaning Mace could theoretically one-shot anyone on this list under the right circumstances. Moving into feats, Mace Windu would battle an amped Deepa Balaba on Harun Kal during the Clone Wars, and performed well despite being physically, mentally, and spiritually nerfed throughout the entire engagement. While it would not be an easy bout, the nature of these variables all but guarantee that he would be able to defeat her on neutral ground, which makes sense given his accolades. Mace's ranking above ROTS Anakin is founded on a statement made by George Lucas in The Making of Revenge of the Sith book, wherein he asserts that you have to be either Mace or Yoda to compete with the Emperor, as well as if Anakin hadn't gotten all beat up, he could have beat the Emperor. Since Lucas is clearly referring to a hypothetical Anakin Skywalker who had not been mutilated and had instead been allowed to reach the peak of his Force potential, it stands to reason that Mace and Yoda were stronger than prequel Anakin even after his fall to the dark side, which is consistent with their portrayals. Speaking of Anakin's fall, Mace Windu's most impressive combat feat came shortly beforehand when he waged a titanic battle against Darth Sidious within the Chancellor's office. Despite the ease with which Sidious had taken down Tin, Kolar, and Fisto, Windu ultimately triumphed subduing the Dark Titan through a combination of Vopad and Shatterpoint abilities. While many fans like to lowball this feat with the assertion that Sidious threw the fight, these claims are utterly contradicted by the many statements, including those from George Lucas, confirming that Mace can and did directly overpower Sidious. Not only that, but Darth Sidious is stated to have conjured a dark side confusion haze at the start of the battle that weakened Mace and his allies, which explains why the other Masters were killed so quickly and makes the Master of the Order's own performance truly one of the most impressive in the franchise. Grandmaster Yoda is at the top of this tier, and I doubt many of you expected otherwise. With nearly 900 years of training and experience under his belt by the time of Episode 3, he has been described as a literal fountain of light not totally unlike the Daughter of Mortis. I'm not claiming that the two are equals or anything like that, but the similarities and verbiage are interesting to point out. Much like Mace Windu, Yoda has enough material detailing his strength to fill the Kaminoan Sea. He is confirmed at numerous points in the prequel timeline to be the strongest member of the High Council, the most skilled practitioner of the Ataru style, and one of the most powerful Jedi Masters in the entire Star Wars franchise. While Anakin is also occasionally referred to as the strongest Jedi of the era, not only are the bulk of those accolades made in reference to his potential rather than his actual ability, but Yoda is directly scaled above the prequel Chosen One by George Lucas. It should also just make logical sense given how the story plays out. If Anakin was way stronger than Sidious, then why would Yoda insist on Obi-Wan being the one to confront him while he went after the Emperor? Especially since Yoda likely has a better understanding of Anakin's capabilities than most people. As one would expect from a being of his age and position, Yoda's Force mastery was about as refined as you could get. 
He has the largest scale feats of telekinesis of the entire council and, more importantly, is the most consistent in his portrayals. Yoda also shared Yaddle and Oppo's respective mastery of the Force Light and Battle Meditation techniques, and he is the only counselor of his era to have advanced his Tuta Menace to where he could use it to dispel Sith Lightning, meaning that Plo's electric judgment wouldn't be all that effective. Throughout the Clone Wars, Master Yoda would duel Count Dooku during the First Battle of Geonosis and a mission to Vajun, and, in both instances, would force the Sith Lord to retreat after a hard-fought battle. The Vajun feat is particularly notable since, although Dooku was mentally nerfed at the time, he was also drawing on the energies of the planet's dark side nexus to amp himself, with the Grand Master heavily implying that the Sith Lord's newfound power surpassed even Mace Windu's. Yoda's most notable feat came at the climax of ROTS, wherein he fought a literal historic battle with Darth Sidious within the Senate arena. While the Emperor did ultimately best the Grand Master, it was still an extremely close bout, both combatants being severely exhausted and damaged when the dust finally settled. Many have used this loss to argue Mace's superiority over the Grand Master since he himself beat Sidious, However, the ROTS Jr. novelization actually states that Order 66, as well as Anakin's corruption into Darth Vader, made the Sith Emperor more powerful. Meaning that the Sidious Yoda only narrowly lost to scales above the one Mace defeated. Add this to the mainline novelization directly referring to Yoda as the fiercest, most implacable, most devastatingly powerful foe the darkness had ever known, and it really goes without saying that when it comes to the prequel era, the little green man is supreme. Last but certainly not least, we have the post-prequel era and hypothetical S-Tier+. In this category, we have Force Unleashed Shock T, A New Hope Ben Kenobi, Dark Times Yoda, and a hypothetical full potential Anakin Skywalker. Now, the power scaling for the Jedi Council members who survived the fall of the Old Order has been the subject of debate within the Star Wars fandom for many years. This is because the lore itself is a bit inconsistent on how these Jedi developed and where their potentials capped out. That said, much like any Star Wars-centric debate, there is more evidence pointing in one specific direction over another. Looking at it purely as is, with all of the sources considered, the post-prequel era members of the Jedi High Council are stronger and more refined than their past selves. Allow me to elaborate. Starting with an overall summary, the Force Unleashed campaign guide states that one of the paths adopted by the Jedi of the Dark Times was one of hidden training, with Shock T, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Yoda being cited explicitly as examples of those who spent their days honing their skills in the Force, meditating, and practicing their lightsaber techniques in preparation for the inevitable rebellion against the Galactic Empire. This accolade is corroborated by ROTS's confirmation of Yoda's and Obi-Wan's force training under the spirit of Qui-Gon Jinn, as well as Ryder Winham's novel The Life and Legend of Obi-Wan Kenobi confirming that the Jedi Master had continued his lightsaber training during his exile on Tatooine. With all that in mind, it's not really a question of whether or not the surviving Council Masters improved as it is by how much and in what ways. As I mentioned in her previous analysis, Darth Vader still considered Shakti to be a true Jedi Master and a worthy final test for his apprentice Galen Merrick even after so many years. Galen himself described Shock's aura as a beacon of light within the planet Felucia's dark side nexus, with issue 140 of the Insider magazine proclaiming her to be one of the most powerful Jedi, presumably in all of history, which is not an accolade that was ever attributed to her prequel era self. Her strength in the light was such that her presence alone held back Felucia's darkness from consuming the entire planet, which, as we know, happened following her death. 
Again, this is a level of forced connection and ethereal influence unseen in the character at any point beforehand. Three years prior to the original trilogy, Shakti fought Galen Merrick at the heart of Felucia's ancient abyss, and though defeated, it was anything but a one-sided battle. Not only did Shock go hit for hit with the young Darksider, but she also utilized a handful of force techniques that she had never demonstrated previously, such as multi-animal bonds, Sith Lightning level 2 to menace, and what is generally believed to be a light side variant of Kinetite to blast her foe into oblivion. Galen only ends up winning the fight thanks to a desperate TK block freezing Shock's saber mid-swing, which gave him an opening to stab her through the stomach. The novelization noting that he had been shocked by how close he had come to death and how lucky he had been to defeat her. While this was not a prime Galen Merrick, considering that Galen, even as a teenager, was stated to be more powerful than many of the Jedi Knights had been during the Clone Wars, with the Sith Apprentice later gaining even more strength from both his Sith knighting and previous Jedi battles, Shock's ability to come within a hair's breadth of killing such a foe is legendary. Add this to the previous one of the most powerful Jedi accolade, and I think it's reasonable to conclude that TFU Shock T would, at the bare minimum, advance from the A to the S tier of this list. However, an argument can be made for higher depending on where you scale Felucia Galen Merrick. Either way, if this version of Shock had been at the Jedi Temple when Vader attacked, things would have definitely gone a lot differently. Up next, we have Ben Kenobi during the time frame of A New Hope. Old Ben's growth between the prequel and original trilogies is one that is heavily slept on in the fandom, and I used to be guilty of this as well. You can say he's a brittle old man past his prime, but you can just as easily say that he's in the top 30 of the entire franchise. While there is no question that the Jedi Master's physical capabilities had diminished over the years, that seems to be the only loss he suffered. The power of the light side of the Force is shown repeatedly to preserve one's combative viability well beyond their typical thresholds. With Jedi Masters such as Arka Jeth, Anya Kuro, and, of course, Yoda, all achieving incredible feats long after their youth had passed them by. Prequel Obi-Wan's true education in the Force is stated to have only just begun by the ROTS Visual Dictionary, with the ANH equivalent stating that Ben's powers made him a threat to the Empire even in his elder years. Moving into feats, the primary substantiation for Ben Kenobi being more refined than his past self is his fight against Darth Vader aboard the first Death Star. Given that this was the first lightsaber duel ever depicted, numerous statements concerning its variables have been published. Said variables tend to fall into one of three camps. Either A, Ben is just straight up an even match for Vader and willingly allowed himself to die in an effort to teach Luke, B, he could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Vader for a time, but would grow too fatigued to sustain the effort needed to win. Or C, he could pose a threat, but had no real hope of actually winning, and was simply trying to stall for time. Regardless of the variance, the vast majority of content does support the notion that Ben Kenobi is still a significant threat to Darth Vader, even if they are not equals. Before their duel, Vader refers to Kenobi as the last and greatest of all the Jedi. While this was years before the Dreadlord learned of Yoda's survival, it is still more significant praise than he ever gave to Shakti. Jumping to the fight proper, Vader repeatedly makes note of his old teacher's accomplished fighting technique, and even goes as far as to state that he needed to put in his full effort to win lest the Jedi Master kill him in the blink of an eye. This might seem strange considering that Vader initially calls Ben weak, however this was clearly intended as a taunt, and Vader even admits in the New Hope Jr. novelization that he had been wrong in assuming that Obi-Wan's strength had diminished over time. As I covered in my Skywalker family ranking video, Vader was able to grow stronger than his prequel era self fairly early into his Sith career, standing far above the Lore Pellic Carvastor, 
whom Mace Windu stated was stronger than himself and possessed raw power on the scale of Yoda and Anakin Skywalker. While Prime Galen Merrick defeated Vader at the end of TFU-1, the comic book adaptation and the sequel storyline confirm that this loss was mainly due to the Sith Lord underestimating his former apprentice. Speaking of The Force Unleashed 2, Darth Vader would later battle Starkiller, a near-perfect clone of Galen Merrick on Kamino, and would hold a significant advantage throughout most of the duel. Starkiller is confirmed by Insider Issue 120 to be more powerful than Galen Merrick, yet even he admitted that he could not take the Sith Master in a direct engagement, with the best possible outcome being a stalemate. Again, Vader only ends up losing due to a combination of being caught off guard by Juno Eclipse and Starkiller capitalizing on his vulnerability to Force Lightning with the game's depiction showcasing the clone needing to amp himself with the energies of Kamino Storms to do so successfully. Combine all of that with statements asserting that Darth Vader constantly grows in strength and had reached a new peak of power by the time of A New Hope, this would make kindly old Alec Guinness Ben Kenobi, um, stronger than ROTS Anakin as well as relative to, if not stronger than Starkiller. I'm sure that statement will cause absolutely no controversy and get me utterly reamed in the comments. Nope, not at all. Original trilogy Yoda's scaling is hard to pin down since his development is explored the least out of all the Jedi on this tier, with his portrayal taking on several different forms at varying points in the timeline. Obviously, Return of the Jedi Yoda would be at the bottom of this entire list since he is sick and quite literally one nap away from death. Empire Strikes Back Yoda is clearly in better shape, but by how much is difficult to say given the time difference of only one year. That being said, Yoda still has the Qui-Gon and TFU guide training accolades I mentioned earlier, so it is indisputable that he became stronger than his Revenge of the Sith self, even if his growth was less dramatic than his peers. Starkiller is shocked by the Grand Master's ability to remain in constant proximity to the energies of Dagobah's Dark Side Cave in the TFU novelization, with the clone stating that the being sitting in front of him clearly possessed power out of all proportion with his size. Yoda is also referred to by the fact file as having been the greatest of all Jedi Masters upon his passing, which, even if the statement is about more than just strength, is still solid evidence for him being equal to or slightly above Ben at certain points in history. Regarding showings, post-prequel Yoda only has one combative feat to his name that took place almost entirely off-screen, but it is a bit of a doozy. At some point after the events of ROTS but before ANH, Yoda waged a day and a half long fight with an ancient Bafasi Dark Jedi who was described as having all of Darth Vader's power but none of his self-control and defeated him, the swamps blazing with fire and lightning. Now, the exact time frame for this fight has been retconned repeatedly. However, even if we concede that it took place early in the Dark Times, this is still a monumental feat for Yoda due to Vader surpassing his prequel Anakin self early into his Sith career. Suppose you want to push the battle further into the timeline. In that case, OT Yoda's ranking above his ROTS incarnation becomes even more solidified due to the Dark Lord's massive strength gains between the two trilogies. Some of you may argue that the Bafasi's comparison to Darth Vader was simply hyperbole, however, it kinda can't be given the absurd length of the battle. Are you really going to try and convince me that it took Yoda 36 hours to defeat a Dark Jedi who was D-tier? If so, you will also have to persuade me that it would take him that long to deal with Yariel Poof. See what I mean? Finally, we have the hypothetical version of Anakin Skywalker who has reached his full potential. Again, I cover this in more depth in my Skywalker video, but I'll reiterate the broad points. Regardless of how large you think the power gap would be, or in what manner his abilities would manifest, there is no doubt that a theoretical peak Anakin would be stronger than not just the various members of the prequel era Jedi Council, but really any version of the group prior to his death. 
He is stated to possess a greater aptitude with the Force than any Jedi who had come before him in the old Jedi Order's entire history. With even Darth Vader, at his peak in Return of the Jedi, being incapable of reaching the heights his former self could have. During the Mortis trilogy, Anakin Skywalker briefly unlocks his full power by merging his spirit with the Force dimensional plane. With his newfound strength, the Chosen One simultaneously dominated the son and the daughter in their bestial states. This feat is more impressive than anything the other counselors on this list have done since all of the ones were stated to be more powerful than Abeloth, whose strength exceeded that of Fate of the Jedi Luke Skywalker, who by that point had long surpassed the strongest incarnation of Darth Sidious. This may sound like a strange accolade since both the son and the daughter were shown to be afraid of Abeloth and needed to be saved by their father, who, in his prime, was the strongest of the entire celestial race. However, given the story context surrounding the flashback and the various supplemental material informing it, it's more than likely that the son and daughter were nerfed due to their love for their surrogate mother and the horridness of her sudden transformation. On the whole, when it comes to combative ability, a hypothetical full potential Anakin Skywalker is only surpassed by hypothetical full potential versions of Luke and Leia, and is, most assuredly, the strongest potential version of any member of the Jedi High Council. Looks like he didn't need to be granted the rank of Master after all. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown and ranking of the prequel era Jedi Council. This one is definitely going to incur a lot of discussion, so I'm very excited to hear what you all have to say. As always, leave any thoughts or questions in the comments section below. May the Force be with you, stay safe, and I'll see you guys later.